I want to welcome folks who will be watching this video in the weeks ahead. It is March the 10th, 2023. Daylight savings time in our... <laughs> 24. Thank you. See? No, I just threw that in. You thought that was a mistake, but I threw that in just to make sure no one was sleeping. That's great. Anyways, we are so glad that you're visiting with us, and we hope this message and the reading today from Heather will inspire you. So, Heather, if you want to, there you go. Go ahead and speak, please. The reading today is from Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 to 34. Jesus and his disciples went to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do, you, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Heather. Around this time of year, closer to Easter, CNN oftentimes uh, airs a series called Jesus, Fact, Faith, or Forgery. And it's exploring the different views of who Jesus truly was for both the people of Jesus' day and for those in our contemporary 21st century society. And the series poses the question, not dissimilar to the question that Jesus asked the disciples that you just heard Heather read from Mark's Gospel. Who do you say I am? Well, he starts out, who do people say I am? He'll get more personal in a moment, but he says, who do people say I am? Now, I want to take a look at that question posed by Jesus because for his disciples, it forced the issue and it forced them to decide what they really thought about who Jesus was. And, of course, there were a variety of perspectives that they had heard as they were traveling around. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah or anointed one. Messiah or anointed one is the Hebrew word, but Christ is the Greek translation of that. And in the first century Jewish context, Messiah without fail was always referring to some gifted, wasn't, I should say, referring to a gifted rabbi or teacher or uh, some kind of prophet. No, rather the Messiah is the promised Davidic king whom God would send to restore justice and the fortunes of the Jewish people and to boot out the Roman occupation forces. That's who they believed God's Messiah would be. And so naturally that view of the Messiah is what the followers of Jesus thought that Jesus would conform to. And I'm sure that that was reinforced by the power he exhibited when he healed the sick, when he walked on the water, when he fed 5,000, his prophetic words and the passion that he had to draw these large crowds, I'm sure the disciples felt like this could be the Messiah who is going to come and restore Israel to the former glory of the Davidic kingdom. It's like all of the Trump supporters make America great. This is what they thought in Jewish terms, make Israel great again, God, restore the Davidic kingdom with your revolutionary Messiah, who has to be a warrior because there's an occupation force here. So when Jesus poses this pivotal questions to the disciples, they're a little bit tentative, maybe a little bit shocked, and, and they say, well, some say you're John the Baptist, raised from the dead, because John the Baptist had been beheaded at that point. Others say Elijah or one of the prophets. 
And, and each one of those kind of people or figures that they were referencing were people who were there as prophets to kind of shake up the establishment. But then Jesus gets a bit more personal with that follow-up question. Now, who do you say I am? Now, that's different. The ever-so-bold and rash Peter thinks he's got it. He, he's been Jesus' right-hand man, and so he believed that Jesus was primarily there to restore the glory of Israel. He was the Messiah. He was the one who had power to bring back the old-time religion. Get straight with the Lord. Let's get back on track. And so he says, you're the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. In other words, you're the messianic savior of our nation. But then, as Jesus explains what the messianic savior is for him, hmm, well, the disciples don't really like that. Because Jesus says that what the future Messiah really looks like it doesn't jive with the traditional Jewish understanding of this warrior king who would march in and do battle with the evil forces and put on the throne this theocracy, this God-ordained person who would be the Messiah. And so Peter takes Jesus aside when he hears that Jesus says, no, the Messiah is going to actually suffer and, and be arrested and be rejected by all of the religious leaders. They're not going to see me as the Messiah at least not in the Jewish understanding of that day, and ultimately I'm going to be killed. And so Peter takes him aside to, so that he can tell Jesus he's got it all wrong. And so he begins to strong arm Jesus, but Jesus pushes back and says something to Peter, which is a little bit shocking. He says, get behind me, Satan. Now, I know some of you have heard that in your prayers before, right? Anyone ever hear God tell you, get behind me, Satan? Most of us haven't. <laughs> but it seems a little bit surprising coming out of the mouth of meek and mild and gentle and kind-hearted Jesus, doesn't it? But Jesus is pretty strong on this point because he doesn't want those who are ultimately following him to get this misunderstanding of what they think the Messiah should be and what in actual fact the Messiah really is all about. Now, perhaps you can see why Peter was really confused about Jesus' view of the Messiah. Because Jesus did say, the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected and killed, but after three days rise again. Never before that moment had anyone in Israel connected suffering and rejection and death with the Messiah. Never happened before. They could never imagine that that would be the way the Messiah would have to go. The Messiah is supposed to defeat evil and injustice and make everything right as rain. Isn't that the kind of Messiah you want? You see, the disciples wanted Jesus to conform to their plans and their understanding of what God should do to bring about a changed world and to usher in this new kingdom. And perhaps we all fall into this pattern when Jesus' path and ways bumps up against our own personal expectations of what we should do or what God should do in our lives or in our world today. Now, I can be an awful lot like Peter. I'm kind of rash. I, I say things off the cuff which get me in trouble when we leave the sanctuary. I guarantee you when I go home, Connie is usually there to correct me like Jesus was correcting Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You know, or get behind me, Ed, or something like this. I don't know what it is. Case in point. Case in point. I'll hear about this after. Please pray for me. Now, over the years, I've accumulated a lot of assumptions about God and how God should arrange things in my life the way I want and what God should do in the church and in the world around me. Now, I know you don't think that way. You are perfect people who never think that God should, you know, change God's plans to arrange it according to your life or according to what you think. But most of us do that. I think for many people, Jesus isn't the type of Messiah we think he should be. And lots of people, lots of Christians, walk away from their faith 
And from God, when God doesn't live up to their expectations, especially when life gets a little bit hard, or when you're going through a wilderness season in your life, and you think that, that God should meet you in the way that you expect God to, and then God doesn't always show up the way you want. And lots of Christians over the centuries have just walked away from God when you know, God didn't really meet their needs the way they thought God should. Now you might think that if you were there when Jesus was alive and you heard him speak or perform a miracle, well, you'd follow him no matter what he said or what he did, but that's not exactly how everyone responded to Jesus. Even some of his most devoted followers really did not want Jesus to go down that path, and they were a little bit perturbed about Jesus, some of his messages, and some of the things he did. There's a very brief passage recorded in John's Gospel. Most of us have probably have kind of skipped over it, but it happened early on in Jesus' ministry. It's John chapter 6, verse 66. And it was after a time when Jesus gave some pretty tough teachings to the people that they didn't really want to hear. And sometimes the, the message in the gospel is not things that always sit well with us. Sometimes we just don't want to hear what God has to say to us or to other people. Here's what that passage says. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. In other words, there were more than 12 disciples following Jesus. There was a larger group of people, whether it was 20 or 30 or more. And at a certain point, some of them had a little bit of a rebellion and said, you know what, Jesus isn't the guy for me. They stopped following him. Timothy Keller says this, if you really want Jesus to fit into your own agenda, then Jesus is just the means for you to get what you want. You're using him. But if Jesus is truly the King and Messiah, you cannot make him a means to your end. You can't negotiate your terms. I'll obey you, God, if you do this for me. Quid pro quo. I'll follow you if you meet my expectations. Keller says he's a king who went to the cross for you and for all humanity. Therefore, I hope you can submit to him out of love and trust. Now that's not always easy. I think, though, Keller has this great point, because Jesus' question, who do you say, um, pushes us to consider if Jesus truly is the person you want to follow. That question isn't about, do you believe Jesus as a historical figure, or do you believe in certain doctrines about Jesus? No, I think it's more like, do you trust him? It's a question of commitment. Do you really trust God? when it's not easy to trust him? Do you really want to follow him when it's not easy to follow God? And perhaps that's at the heart of Peter's problem. Could he trust that Jesus might just know better what it means to truly be the Messiah? Not just for the Jewish people at a certain era, but the Messiah for all humanity of all time. That's quite a different Messiah. And so just as Peter needed to take this leap of faith to believe and trust in Jesus beyond this traditional kind of Hebrew notion of what the Messiah had to conform to, this conquering hero, we must take Jesus at his word as well about the kind of Messiah we're following today. When we look around and see the darkness and wars and evil that seems to be ever so present, we might just like a conquering hero to come in to save the day and smite the bad people. I think that's what a lot of Christians really would like to see today. But that's not the kind of Messiah Jesus was then or is now. He is a suffering, sacrificial, loving Messiah who reveals through his words and actions that the way to true redemption and the kingdom of God that ultimately will reign on earth. For Jesus, it is to suffer and die on the cross. It's the only way that it could ever happen. Jesus' message and his path to the cross was so very radical when you really think about it. If he came at a time in history to simply lead a military revolution and, and restore the fortunes of Israel 
you know, first century Israel, would that kind of kingdom really change the world? Probably not. And this hard message comes to us 2,000 years later. It's this message where Jesus affirms that he is the Messiah, but not like any Messiah you've ever imagined. He says, I'm king, a Messiah who must die. But he goes even further, because what he says is this. If anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. I wish Jesus hadn't put that in there. It, it would be so much easier to be a follower of Jesus if we you know, just sang the Beatles song, love, 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 do, 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 love. You know, just get along, get over it, let there be peace on our, you know, all that stuff. But Jesus says, hmm, that's probably not the way it's gonna work out. Because if they're gonna kill me, and if I'm gonna to have to suffer to show the incredible sacrificial love of God, even to people who reject me, then do you think you'll have an easy time of it? You probably won't. You see, this is not an easy message to sell to most people. Most of us, particularly in the West, live comfortable lives. Most of us, you know, are well-educated, emotionally stable, well, save for me, and have good families and come from good homes. From our cultural perspective, we want Jesus to just keep on blessing us with those kind of things. But Jesus is saying, when it gets tough, will you still want to follow me? When life doesn't go the way you expect it, when you are suffering or when someone around you passes away unexpectedly or life is just so crappy, will you still trust me and follow me? Will you still believe that I can help you through the messes of life? Do you still believe that I can bring you comfort or hope or healing and resurrection? Sometimes we prefer a softer Messiah, a more meek and mild Jesus, a comfortable Messiah, a Messiah who talks and acts much like the way we do, one who doesn't demand too much but you see, that's not who Jesus was when he walked the earth, and that's not who he is, not at least in his fullness. That's part of Jesus, but that's not the full Jesus. The Apostle Paul understood the radical nature of Jesus, the Messiah, the one that no other faith in the world down through history has really even come close to, I think, in the imagination of what Jesus does. And I want to read the passage of Scripture from Philippians that kind of Paul condenses a lot of the message of Jesus and a lot of what he came to do. This is in the second chapter. He says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ, the Messiah, Jesus, who being in the very nature God, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but in actual fact made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow, every tongue confess in heaven, on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Paul goes on, remember he says, don't do anything out of selfish ambition, vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. This is what Jesus did. He considered everyone else better than himself in this sense that he was willing to go to the cross and die for everyone. Humble yourself isn't an easy concept in our culture when we're encouraged to think of ourselves above almost everyone or everything else. But this is the way of the cross and that's the way that Jesus lived. Now, it doesn't seem to be the way to get a following, does it? But Jesus, you see, isn't trying to win a popular opinion contest. That's not what he cares really about. He's trying to save the world. He's trying to save people from their own self-destructive natures, from the destruction that goes on around us. And to do that, it's going to take a great deal of love, sacrificial love. He will not take the easy path to victory. His path leads straight towards the cross. That's exactly where Jesus is going. And he says, if you can't follow me on the way to the cross, then you probably better find something else to do with your life. 
Jesus invites us to follow him in this pattern of humility and to live a life of great love and sacrifice. And I know probably all of you do that to a certain extent, or at least try. To place God at the center of our lives and not on the periphery is never easy. But look where it leads. This is what Paul said. It leads beyond the cross, beyond humi humiliation, beyond terrible things to Jesus. It leads to exalted position in heaven. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name above every name. And as followers of Jesus, this is also where it leads us. And God gives us his Holy Spirit to encourage us and to help us live lives of humility, grace, and deep sacrificial love. The Holy Spirit, when given sway in our lives, can remold our character, our hearts, to where we see that God can use us for some greater redemptive purpose and for God's kingdom purposes in the world. Friends, once you begin to see Jesus as the whole, in this whole new light as the Messiah, like Peter did, when you start to understand that he went to the cross for you and for the world, when you see God in Christ loving you like that, well, hopefully you begin to discover that you can't negotiate with God. <laughs> you just have to follow. Now, I know it's not easy. It's simple. You say, oh, I just follow Jesus, right? Well, of course, we know it's never simple like that. That means you have to be attentive to vo the voice of God. You have to know the scriptures. You, you have to understand that God is going to speak in that still small voice to you and give you guidance. But oftentimes, you know, you have to pay attention to what God is doing and where God is leading you. It's not always an easy path. But when you find that Jesus gave up his life for this divine calling and divine purpose, and we get to follow that divine Messiah, to also bring about God's kingdom in this world, then we have what we need to have to face all the challenges of life, all the problems, the pain, the sadness, the grief, and know that ultimately we are victorious in Christ who sets us free, who went to the cross so we can really be free and share that gospel message with the people around us.